Well, good morning, North Athens. Good to be with you this morning. A little different being up here, being able to share with you. I'm looking forward to it and thankful to be having the opportunity to uh, share with you from the pulpit. I am sorry for what Pastor Meyer was going through, but God is touching him and giving him the strength and we continue to join our prayers with you for his healing and for that treatment that's coming up to be successful and to God to uh, renew him. And also, just to say it personally and um, from, uh, from, my, from my mouth, that uh, we are blessed to be able to uh, have Pastor Mark come and be your senior pastor. And we are fully confident that he will do a great job with you. We have grown to love he and Rachel and Caden and know that you will love him. He's, uh, his heart is as big as he is like Marv. And uh, you will come to appreciate him, his humor, his passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a heart uh, for the Lord. That's uh, wonderful. You will be blessed by that. And I look forward to seeing what God is going to do through him with you all together and us together as we reach our community for Jesus Christ. We don't suffer from a lack of churches here. Not based on the statistics and the numbers of people who live here versus the number of people who go to church. There's still a huge, a huge gap, a huge number of people that we haven't reached yet for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's going to take more than us and you and North Athens and others around. So, you know, God needs to keep raising us up and helping us to reach our community for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray God will richly use Pastor Mark and Rachel towards that end and us together. We've had a wonderful relationship with North Athens. Pastor Marvin has been a wonderful mentor and friend to have to know. I've appreciated him. He's been so good to me and our church and the relationship we've had. We partnered together. You know, when I first came to Waukesha 25 years ago, almost 26 years ago, uh, you all were here. We were working together on Wednesday nights with Arwana and doing some things together, and that was a joy. I got to know a lot of you through that. What a privilege that was. And I hope we can do some other things together, too, and, and maintain and grow that connection. It's been a blessing to do that. So thank you for the privilege to allow me to share with you this morning. I'm looking forward to what God has laid on my heart to share. Um, Jerry, just to double check. Um, you get, all get out about 1 o'clock. Is that what I understand? <laughs> all right. I'm assuming it's about noontime. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So I'll be sharing with you. I'm going to take you to a passage in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through the end. And I appreciate the worship team and the, and the song selects that you had. Uh, talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. The King is coming. Wonderful. And what's going to happen when he comes? The glory. <laughs> the glory. Uh, the new kingdom he's going to bring on earth as it is in heaven. The glory of God. Wow, we are going to be changed. We're going to be transformed. We're going to become like him. We're going to be able to see him face to face. Right now, it's like through a mirror darkly that we see, and we get a glimpse of who Jesus is. And not only do we, we get a glimpse of who Jesus is, we see his glory. But you know what we don't realize is what we're destined for? What we're going to be in Christ Jesus? What we're going to be like in him? If we, if we realized, if we could see that, we would never be the same, and we would never look at each other the same either. We would treat each other differently if we realize the glory that awaits us, that we're going to be transformed, and we're going to become like him. Oh, let that sink in. So that being the case, Jesus is coming back again, and we're going to be made like him. What kind of people ought we to be? <laughs> what should we be doing? First John says... Knowing that he's going to become, he's coming back again, we ought to, what kind of people ought we to be? We ought to live pure and holy lives. We ought to be glorifying God and helping each other to do that. So here's how Ephesians 5 puts it. Here's how we can help each other to be what God wants us to be, to be on this journey that we are on, to become like Christ. One day we're going to be like him. So what do we do? How do we help each other get there? How's the Lord used us? And I want to focus on that because we don't always appreciate that. I don't always realize how God has given me each other, given me fellow Christians and others to help me to become like Christ. I need that. We need that. We need each other. And here's what he says is how it's going to happen. And he begins in verse 21 by saying this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. Now he's saying this as he started the chapter by talking about Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, 
as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Live a life of love like Jesus did. He gave himself. Now, how do we give ourselves? He says, submit to one another. Give yourself to one another. Serve one another is another way of putting that. And here's what this submission looks like. In marriage, it looks like this. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband, I'm reading from the New International Version in case you have a different translation than what I'm reading from. It may seem a little different. King James, pretty similar. But for the wife, submit to the wife, submit to your husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, you so also wives submit, should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives as just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Let's pray. Father, would you bless this word and the preaching of it to our ears? Help me to share it well. I pray for an openness, and I pray that uh, your spirit will take these words and help it to understand and, and hit home and uh, get applied to our lives and put it into practice for your glory and your honor. I just ask your help in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been doing a series on marriage based on this passage. And I'm in a point now where we're talking about how God is brought a husband and wife together to help each other to become like Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church to present her holy and blameless, without spot, radiant in his sight. What a call that is. What a picture and a vision he has for marriage in the church and what we're called to. And one day Jesus is going to present us together, all believers, as his bride before the throne of God, holy and blameless, without spot, radiant, beautiful in his sight. Me, us, together. We're going to be that way in his presence. Imagine that. I'm looking around. I said this to my own church. I can say it to you all. I'm looking around and say, who? Goodness, we got some work to do. <laughs> yes, sir. I look at my own life. <laughs> Man, I've got some wrinkles. I've got some flaws. I've got some things that need to be transformed and changed. I don't always reflect the beauty of my Lord. I know the way he wants. And so I need help to become like Jesus. And one day I'm going to be like him. So the journey has begun now. And that's what he pictures this marriage as this companion, this relationship where, where, where the two become one, he says, like a husband and wife. And in Christ, you become one with him. You develop this close relationship with him. And you together are on this journey to become radiant and spotless and beautiful in sight. That's what he has intended us for. Whether in a church, in a church relationship, he's intended the family of God to be that to each other, to help each other to become like Christ wants us to be. He's intended on our marriage relationships. And whether you're married or not, it's okay. Because it extends so far. It extends our relationships with one another. How we're to live this out. We need each other to become like Christ. I need your help. Hmm. How does that happen? I want to talk about that. How does, how does God use the two of us to become one in marriage and, and together, how does God use us to help each other become like Christ? I haven't always appreciated that. I don't know about you, but sometimes we, we, we get the purpose of marriage wrong and the, what the purpose of the church is. The pr purpose of the church is not for you to come and, and sit and be happy and content and enjoy yourself, although you ought to have some fun. But that's not the purpose. Marriage is not just to make you happy and to give you a little thrill and romance every now and then and uh, have somebody who takes, you know, take care of each other. And There's so much more than that. The two, he says, the two of you will become one. That's a powerful image and calling that he has, becoming one, that you're who you marry. You're intended to have this deep, close relationship that's like Christ with his church, he wants us, invites us into and calls us into this deep, 
close relationship where we share life together. And I picture it as we're on a journey, and this is what the journey is heading us to. We are going to stand in his presence one day, radiant and without spot. That's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. And we're here to help each other get there. And marriage, you're there to help each other become more like Christ. So let the sparks fly. Yeah, it gets a little messy. It gets a little challenging at times, and there's nothing wrong with that. And church gets messy. In the best of churches, it gets messy. I can't divulge uh, you know, personal information, what Marva shared about you to me, but <laughs> or me to, <laughs> me to him, Bob Cashman. No, just kidding. You always wonder what pastors do when they get together. You know, we don't talk about each other's churches. But we do talk about how we can help each other become what Christ wants us to be. And in marriage, that's where we need to focus on that. I need help to become what Christ wants me to be. See, we have a problem. And if I were to ask you, what's the number one problem in marriage or number one problem in church? You'd come up with a few answers, okay? They'd all be true to one degree or another. But I think what we need just to be honest and say, you know what the number one problem in marriage is? And church, it's <laughs> me. I am the problem. My selfishness is the problem. My stinking sinfulness is the problem. And I don't even realize the half of it. And how some of the things I do and say are hurtful and not pleasing to Jesus Christ. They're not good and I need to be helped with that. I need to be confronted with that. I need to be challenged with others. I just, or otherwise, I just stay in that same rut or that wrong way of living. I need help to get out of that, to break out of that selfishness and that sin and to be a servant and to love others. I need help to do that. And here's the help. Walk in the Spirit. You do not, you know, you not gratify the desires of the flesh. Let the Spirit change you. Let the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ change you and let others, let Him use others to help bring that out, the glory of Jesus Christ. Let, it, let us sharpen each other and help each other. I haven't always appreciated that about marriage or the church. And really be honest, sometimes we just like to keep things comfortable. And, and, and again, I'm just taking another step here, okay? So those of you that are married might get a little squirmy. But here's what happens in marriage. Here's why, because I can see it. I see it in my life. You know, I've had to fight against this. But sometimes in marriage, we, get, we just have an understanding sometimes, you know. Okay, I've been married to you long enough. I've been married... 35 years. We got married young. But, um, <laughs> and when we got married, I didn't know the half of the flaws and imperfections I had and sinfulness and selfishness in my life. Man, I didn't realize how immature I was, <laughs> how blind I was to things. And I didn't realize that as I got close to somebody else in marriage that all those things would start coming out. She thought she married a perfect man. <laughs> Not. <laughs> and that happens, doesn't it? It doesn't take long in a close relationship. You begin to see each other's weaknesses and flaws. And, uh, you know. and in the church, you hang around each other long enough. You start seeing it. Pastor Meyer's been here, what, 30-some years? Or 35? I don't know. How, you know he's, that's amazing to have that kind of longevity. Either you stick in there and you start to love people over that time, or you, you, know, you, just, you just bail out. I'm so thankful that God's given me the grace and the, my church the patience to put up with me for 25 years. You know what's happened? The people I would not have probably normally associated with or become friends with, I have. They have blessed my life in ways I would never have gained because I would have never thought, ah. But now, you know, being in that kind of situation where God puts you together, you don't get to pick and choose your Brothers and sisters in Christ, he said, this is your family. Love them. Let them love you. And when you do, they can teach you things. They can show you things. They can help you. They can challenge you. <laughs> they can get on your nerve. But boy, if you let them, if you let God use them, they'll sharpen you. They'll, they'll beautify you. They'll make you more like Christ if you let them. And a marriage that's intended to be that way, God, help me to bring out the best. I don't want to bring out the worst. And we can do that, folks. We can, that can happen. Even in the church. And you see the same dynamics. It can happen in the church. It can happen in the, your marriage, close relationships. Just by the way you treat each other and the words you use and how you respond and act towards each other, you're either going to be, be encouraging each other onward to Jesus to become more like him, or you're going to be hurting them and wounded them and, and creating problems in their lives that draw them away from Christ instead of towards him. 
I don't want that to be true. I want to help build people up. Even if, if I have to confront and challenge and rebuke and exhort and people, I want that to be done with wisdom and gentleness and kindness and so that it's taken well and it's taken in love and it works towards that end of building us up. Not, not just, and here's where I missed my point when I was talking about when you're, when you start living with somebody, you know, married with somebody long over time, okay, you realize, okay, you got problems, you got a lot of problems. You know, I've got a few, but you got a lot of problems. So here's what we're going to do about those problems. I won't bug you with yours, you don't bug me with mine. Do I see any heads rattling out there? <laughs> okay, maybe not do that here, but in the church that can happen too. You know, don't be messing with me. Don't be telling me how to live my life. Who are you? I mean, you got your problems. You're not perfect either. That's such a wrong attitude. Such a wrong attitude. We're here to help each other. To serve one another in love. To give ourselves to one another. As Christ gave himself to the church to bring out the best. And yeah, sometimes I need to challenge you gently, lovingly with the truth. Call you up. Other times I just need to pray for you, encourage you, and bless you, and, and love you, despite your flaws and weaknesses, because that's how Christ treats us and me, and he forgives me, and he's patient with me. Lord, help me to do that with my wife and with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, he says here in this passage in Ephesians 5, it's, he quotes, Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 1, he quotes from Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus said, says the same things. For God's purpose for marriage from the beginning was that a man would leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, bond together, and the two would become one flesh. That's quoted in Genesis, that's creation, it's quoted by Jesus in Matthew 19, and it's quoted by Paul here, so you know you're on good, strong, this is, this is clear teaching from the scripture of what God wants. And what's his purpose for marriage? To bind us together, exclusively, permanently, and love and develop a companionship, a relationship, a best friend relationship with each other that brings out the best, that we help encourage each other to be good what God wants us to be. That's what we need, and that's what marriage is intended, okay? Now, again, I'm saying I tend to be a little more shallow at, at this and a little more immature. I'm trying to grow, trying to become what God wants me to be, but I'll just give you a little story from my life and, and how marriage started working for me. See if it rings a bell for any of you. Um, I was going to church in a youth group, and there was a lot of nice young ladies in that youth group. And being the man that I was, I tended to look for the most attractive ones, <laughs> the best looking ones. I know you wouldn't do that, but that's how I, would, that's how I did it. So I went up to one of the, the most beautiful ones, best looking one I could find, and asked her out one night after church, and she shot me down. So over in the corner was an, another lady, <laughs> girl that I knew and was getting to know, nice, friendly, warm, Christian. And so I go ask her out. And she's the one that ended up becoming my wife, Winifred. And I'm so glad God did that because, see, outwardly I've been looking for the wrong thing. I wasn't looking for a friend, <laughs> okay? But God gave me my best friend. And that's what you want. That's what I need. That's what we need. We need friends. We need that friendship, that love. For one another, that commitment, that devotion to one another. I'll be with you. I'll stick with you through thick or thin. I know you. I see you at your worst, and I'll still love you and accept you and help you. And when you look at friendship in the Bible and what's going on here, and when he's talking about Christian friendships and our relationships with each other in, in the church and in marriage, what Christian friendship looks like, you look at the book of Proverbs. It highlights several qualities a friend has. And here's what I want to just share with you. If we're going to help each other become what Christ wants us to be, if we're going to bring out that glory, if you know we're heading in that direction, we're going to help each other on this journey to one day stand before him, glorious, radiant, beautiful, oh, incredible what we're going to be. We just, we can't imagine the beauty and the radiance, the glory that awaits us. If we could see that right now, we would just, we would be, as C.S. Lewis would say, we'd be tempted to bow down and worship each other. I know it's a little scary, but the glory, if we could get a taste of that, if we could see what God has in store for us, it would just blow us away. What we're going to be. We, we would look at each other so differently when we realize who we're going to be in Him. What, wait, what awaits us? We're going to be like Him? Wow. 
There's no one like him. He's going to let us take on some of that glory so we can know him and live in his heaven and live with him forever in this perfect world. So God is going to use us to help us to get there. The church and marriage relationships is going to help use our friendships to help us get there to become more and more like Christ. So what kind of friend do I need to be? What kind of mate do I need to be? What kind of brother or sister in Christ do I need to be that's going to help you? And book of Proverbs and other passages in the scriptures talk about some of those good qualities that bring out this Christ-likeness and help each other that are beneficial. Number one is, this is true in God's relationship with us and with one another. We've got to be faithful, consistent, and dependable to one another. If we're going to help each other, we need to be there. God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never turn my back on you. On you. You can depend on that. You can trust me for that. To have someone you can trust and you can depend upon, you need that to, to flourish and to be strong and to grow. You will come, you need that, depend on him. Secondly, you need to be open. God says, speak to me truthfully <laughs> in my innermost being. Lord, search me and try me. See if there's some wicked way in me. Lead me in the way of everlasting. God, reveal to me, search me, know me. I, I need to be open before you because I can't have a relationship with you if, there's, if it's things hidden. If I'm lying, if I'm being phony, if I'm being hypocritical, Lord, I need to be open and honest about who I am and who you are. I need the truth of who you are. Be open. God is more than open with us. He reveals himself. Jesus said to us, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends because a friend knows what, is, what he's doing. I'm going to share what Jesus said to his disciples after three years. I call you friends. I'm going to share with you what I know and who the Father is because I want you to know him. I want you to know him like I know him. I want you in on that. And that's what a friend does. They want you to know and they want you to be open. They want you to know them. Well, draw close to them. Experience that closeness, that friendship. Wonderful. Jesus wants that for us, our relationship. But it takes openness and honesty. Here's how you can check yourself on this. Are you the kind of person that you can sit down with somebody and you're comfortable letting them share about their problems and their struggles and their fears and their sins and failures with you, no problem. But when it comes to you sharing the same thing with them, nah, I don't think so. Do you, you find yourself withholding, not being so open? That's what I have to watch. I have to guard against that, that I don't disclose that. Sometimes I don't let others in and, and not being open with them. But it's got to happen in marriage and our friends, Christian friends, we've got to have an openness with each other. So that leads to being vulnerable. <laughs> Can I take risk? Talk about taking risk. Jesus took risk. People mocked him, denied him, rejected him, insulted him, shamed him, but he still loved them. He forgave them. When you reach out to love people and help people, yeah, they may misunderstand you. They may reject you. They may yeesh, hurt you. But let the love of Jesus Christ work in you. And be vulnerable. Take that risk because it's when taking that risk, they, might, they just might receive God's love through you. They just might come to forgiveness. They just might begin to see the error of their ways and repent and turn their lives around because you're willing to take a risk and challenge them or confront them or go to them and love them. Boy, in marriage, we should be able to do that in marriage. It's scary. But build that trust, build that faithfulness, build that openness. See, when you start sharing your life with someone, they usually they'll start sharing theirs. It's hard to be, you know, have that go on for very long that you just start feeling like, okay, you've, you've opened up to me, now I need to open up to you. And then... The last one I'll talk about is, is in a good biblical marriage, uh, friendship, there's a blessing that the friends you have bless you. God blesses us, the greatest friendship of all. He blesses us like no others. You got friends that they give you so much more than you give to them. You ever feel that way? That people, they're, they're saying they're so good. You could never repay them for all their kindness. You just, wow, you are blessed to have people in your life like that. And if you're married to one, oh, man. Wow, double kudos for you. But to have that blessing, people that speak into your life, that encourage you and, and just see the good in you, they see what God wants for you, and they don't, they don't stop believing, they don't stop trusting, they, they just encourage you. And they show you things and they, that you wouldn't indeed dare to believe about yourself. They, they start believing and seeing it, and they encourage you to be that. Oh, we need that. They bless you with words. They bless you 
with actions, okay? We need those. That's the kind of friendship God wants in our lives. And that's what we should be for one another. And that is so helpful and so necessary to, to when life gets messy and difficult. When time gets, when we have to step in and get a little bit of confrontation or conflict is going on, or we need to challenge someone out of their sinfulness, out of their selfishness and their blindness, that doesn't always get well received. But if you've been doing these other things along the way, it's more likely to be received well and responded to with humility and with thankfulness. Thank you for sharing that with me. My best friends are the ones who have challenged me the most, who've called me up and said, man, what do you think you're doing? Did you realize what you just did? I'm often blind to it. I didn't even have a clue. Sometimes not, but others, most of a lot of times, I don't even realize I did something. And they, and they pointed out, and boy, that saved me some grief or helped turn, correct some things that could have been worse. I'm thankful for that. So let us, see, let us see each other so differently, how God wants to use us. So often we want to shy away from others or not be willing to let others, let God use others to help. Bless us, teach us, correct us, encourage us to be what Christ wants us to be. What, what better place for that to happen in the church and among our relationships with each other as brothers and sisters? Amen? Uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time to share with the congregation of North Athens. I ask your blessing on them. Pastor Marv, oh gosh. Lord, the good that you have in store for us. Lord, let the best days yet be here that you have in store for us. And Pastor Mark and Rachel and Caden coming. God, you're going to bless them richly, I pray. But Lord, help us to be the kind of people, the fellowship and Christians that build each other up, encourage each other. Yeah, challenge each other, exhort each other. Speak the truth in love. Because we know the destiny, we know the journey that we're on, the glory that awaits us. And that process has started now. Oh, let us be relentless at it. Let our lives reflect more the beauty of Christ. So others will be drawn to you and others will be encouraged to want to know you and serve you and become a part of your family. For your honor and glory, I pray these things. Amen. Pastor, if you'd be willing to stand.